This is America's Roundtable, a radio program from Washington, D.C., bringing together leaders from business, government, media, and the think tank arena. I am Joel Sami, your co-host, joined by Natasha Sardorch, an economist and co-founder of the International Leaders Summit. America's Roundtable is an initiative of the International Leaders Summit. Thank you for joining us on America's Roundtable from Washington, D.C. We appreciate Lancer Broadcasting and the Pledge Radio based in Michigan for their partnership. Today, we are truly honored to have an extraordinary leader join us on America's Roundtable, Congressman David Bratt, who served the Commonwealth of Virginia's 7th District from 2014 to 2019. Dr. Bratt served on the House Budget Committee, and as a member of the House Freedom Caucus, he led the charge in Congress for a more fiscally responsible budget process. Dr. Bratt is the Dean of the Liberty University School of Business in Lynchburg, Virginia. Dr. Bratt also serves as the president of the Virginia Association of Economists. Importantly, we must also convey a word of deep appreciation to our special guest, Dr. Dave Bratt, who also serves on the International Leaders Summit's Executive Advisory Board. Welcome, Dr. David Brad. It's great to have you join us on America's Roundtable. Welcome, Dr. Brad. Thank you, Joel and Natasha. Thank you for the very generous introduction and for your leadership around the globe on all of our shared values. You do great work. Thank you so much, sir. In a recent op-ed piece via online media group Breitbart, you stated, I quote, In the next few weeks, President Trump will have to make a choice like that of King Solomon. The president has two train engines heading at the American people, and both are full of bad news. There is no good choice, just less bad. One train is the coronavirus damage, and the other train is the economic damage. If he slows the virus, the economic damage grows faster. If he speeds up the economy, the virus damage increases, unquote. Dr. Brad, could you elaborate on the serious concerns raised in your piece? Yeah, sure. I mean, that kind of hits it. And so I was just trying to bring attention to the economic side a little more. The the virus, uh, you know, exponential growth, uh, when something's just growing, you know, shooting up through the roof, everyone's familiar with the uh, infection rates and the death rates. And uh, we see that every day on the news all day. Uh, but you don't see the economic damage uh, as much, and the economic damage is also growing exponentially. And you can see that most clearly in the uh, the unemployment rolls. The folks who are signing up for relief jump from uh, 250,000 to 3 million, then to 10 million a week later. And then uh, Bloomberg has it estimated at 20 million when the April rolls uh, come in. And then Vox. And now Goldman uh, Sachs validated this today, 35 to 37 million in total uh, by the end of April, May in uh, in coronavirus uh, exposed industries, you know, like retail where uh, all the shops have been down, small businesses, hair cutteries, all that kind of thing. And so uh, that gets you up to uh, if you take 35 million out of our workforce, which is about 150 million, that's 20 percent. And so that's. 20% unemployment rate, and that's approaching Great Depression levels. And uh, you can do that, uh, you know, smash the curve, uh, take precautions for about a month or so. But beyond that, uh, the economic harm is going to overtake the uh, virus harm because the sociology liter- literature shows you all sorts of harm, you know, psychological, familial, uh, you know, the, the family abuse, al- alcohol use. Uh, violence starts going up, and then the the most maybe the most crucial. Twenty years from now, anyone who is displaced from the economy, and that's so we're talking 35 million people, will have their wage rates reduced by 20 percent. Twenty years from now, that's the legacy, <clears throat> and so it's permanent damage inflicted on people that lose job skills and have to re-enter the market in in a less productive way. And uh, so the damage there is just is huge. So we have to get smart. Uh, there's no way around the, the risk. There is risk. There is damage that will occur. And we have to uh, choose, like Solomon, very wisely how to open up and be careful, but yet get, get the economy uh, back, back at least rolling, if not humming, soon. Uh, Dr. Brett, you know, you, we, we've been talking to small business owners, entrepreneurs across America. Mm-hmm. 
and they have been conveying their great concern for their employees because they're certainly a part of their own family in a way, uh, and also, right. you know, just in general, their concern for uh, getting things started again. If you were advising state governors across the country, weighing the concerns of citizens' safety and the economy, what would you suggest to state governors today? Yeah, I, w- I would just say the shutdown is too stiff <clears throat> because that takes away all the creativity and entrepreneurial uh, gifts that this country has. The American worker uh, is entrepreneurial and they are creative. And so if you you've got to shut down, period, that doesn't leave any opportunity. Uh, instead, I'd rather say, look, you know, keep doing the social distancing, find creative ways to do your business where you still keep the distance and take precautions. Uh, and you can't have huge groups uh, congregating under under any circumstances yet. But, you know, figure out how to do your business. <clears throat> and American businesses will figure that out. And, it, and if you shut down a uh, small business for more than a month, you know, if it verges on two months, there's a good op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today by, uh, by a father in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Everyone should just look at it. It's just a typical example. And he just shows the fixed costs left to pay. Uh, they can take it for a month, uh, but more than that, probably not. And then you shut it down, uh, and it's going to be hard to flip that light switch back on, right? Do your revenues come right back? Do your employees come right back? Uh, do your customers come right back? And so uh, I'd have quite a bit of latitude right now <clears throat> and uh, really lean in the direction of trying to be uh, business friendly. What would be the steps to reopen the $22 trillion U.S. economy after being shut down? Yeah, well, you just start off. I mean, all the states and localities are interlinked, right? So it should be coordinated. If you open up one county, uh, everybody in all the other counties are closed. Everyone's going to swoop in on that one shop or restaurant, whatever opens up, right? So you don't want that. Uh, You don't want the crowding. And so uh, the the states are going to have to organize with each other. But I would I would take away the shutdown orders that are still in place right underneath under under Virginia law, uh, you know, and and the Michigan laws where, you know, people were protesting in the streets yesterday. Uh, People can't go to their own cottage for some reason, which just makes no sense. Uh, People can't sell flowers in a flower shop if you keep social distance. People can't play tennis or golf uh, where you don't have to be near other people. And so common sense just has to dictate. I don't think there's any way to capture that. But President Trump can use the bully pulpit and just say, look, we're now open for business. Uh, do it uh, smartly and wisely. And there's there's no one size fits all. New York City is going to be very different than Lynchburg, Virginia. And uh, and, and so it, it, it's going to require a little uh, – there's not going to be any perfect uh, efficiency solution. But I, you, you've got to l- let it open up. And then put in place some guidelines, which people still have to follow on the on the precautionary side. But you can still do business that way, and that that's the important part. What are your thoughts about the public health experts saying that we need more nationwide testing, tracing, and surveillance system before we can reopen the economy? Well, it would be nice to have that uh, in place, and uh, I wish all of our organizations had that ready to roll. But they're not ready to roll. And so that's a that's a luxury that will help us to make even better decisions. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, we can't wait for that uh, as it's just not there. And so the 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 free market system uh, has been built up uh, as a social system. Uh, and you, you you it's not like a simple little machine where you can take a part out and replace it or whatever. It's very complex and sophisticated, right? The millions of products that show up in one Walmart store. How does that happen? <clears throat> Through very complex uh, supply chains that reach across the world now. We're going to learn some lessons there. Uh, but it, we cannot take the risk of having that free market system come to a grinding halt and collapse Uh and, and and then you're going to run into all sorts of other economic problems, right? States are already going to be uh, facing severe shortages. They're already bankrupt, right? The New Yorks and the Californias and the Illinois with their pension fund uh, problems and, and corruption. And so uh, I, I can't believe more people aren't uh, aren't moving in this direction. Uh, but the mainstream media is just punching, you know, President Trump every day. Uh, and and they just want to have a failure case for the president instead of rooting for the country, and so you're right. Uh, the tech, we're we're working on it, uh, but the uh, that bureaucracy from the start has has made a few mistakes, 
and uh, they haven't ramped it up and scaled it up in a way that uh, makes it feasible yet. So uh, we have to open up and then do the best we can when those tests become available. Right. Uh, Dr. Brett, uh, the $350 billion loan program for small businesses impacted by the coronavirus pandemic ran out of money on Thursday morning. And now Republicans yeah. are working to approve the $250 billion more for the loans. And on top of this, uh, there is disagreement between Republicans and Democrats about how to replenish the funds. Um, what measures do you suggest should assist small businesses? And do you favor another rollout of small business loans going up to $250 billion or more? Yeah, I, I, I think the, the Senate package is, is acceptable for small business, but I don't think it's going to go through politically. Uh, Nancy Pelosi two weeks ago uh, said she's putting in place a 9-11 type commission to study the causes and, and failures of the coronavirus uh, pandemic spread, uh, pointing the finger at President Donald Trump while tens of thousands of people are dying in the country. And she's putting together a hot political exploratory commission to point fingers right now in the midst of it. And the real uh, danger of this politicization is that she's going to shut down the economic uh, and, and scientific inquiry we need. If anyone has a good idea, uh, they're going to be looking over their shoulders. They cannot send out an email now that may not go before a court. And if they make an error, they could go to jail. So the chilling effect of the politics, and if, if the Democrats don't shut down that proposal, uh, they ought to be booted out of office uh, in, in November. But it, it's become way too political. The Republicans put forward a measure to, uh, to help small business. The Democrats rejected it because they want to load up the Christmas tree and follow Rahm Emanuel, never let a crisis go to waste. And they had it all loaded up with all left-wing propaganda, having nothing to do uh, with uh, solving the corona, coronavirus problem or the unemployment problem. And it's there for all Americans to see. And so uh, I, I, I think uh, President Trump is going to see some success coming up in November because of this. Right. You know, I remember, uh, Dr. Brad, hosting your offices uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia, the Liberty University, a beautiful campus altogether. And uh, I remember very vividly you mentioning about your concerns about an emboldened, an unaccountable China violating international law, stealing intellectual property, sure. exerting pressures in the region. And also, I remember you mentioning about your concerns about how they addressed the outbreak of the coronavirus from Wuhan, uh, Hubei province. Yeah. And, um, you know, we have been following that very closely. We've also noticed how the World Health Organization um, has been sort of a mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party. And um, this past week, uh, President Trump came forward and said, listen, we're going to be suspending aid or assistance or the uh, package of uh, taxpayer dollars to WHO. Um, from your perspective, Dr. Brad, why should America, Europe, and the world be concerned about China? Well, I'll, I'll just give you a shorthand uh, answer. For, everyone ought to read the book Deceiving the Sky by Bill Gertz for 200 pages of evidence. Uh, of which I'll give a few bullet points, right? Uh, so number one, this country achieved greatness that uh, China will never match because of our commitment to the Judeo-Christian tradition, the rule of law, and Adam Smith, uh, the great economist uh, who envisioned the free market system. And freedom and individual rights is at the core of our system. Individual rights, inalienable rights that come from God, protected by the government. China doesn't have those. They don't know what they are. They don't understand what it is. And that's why you have one to three million uh, Turkic Uyghur Muslims uh, in concentration camps in the west of China. The New York Times and Washington Post uh, don't want to cover that story right now at all. Uh, you have the Tiananmen crisis. You have uh, trading in, in body parts uh, going on in China. Uh, you have uh, the, the uh, downplaying of Taiwan and the information they provided to the WHO. You have China flexing its muscle across the world with the Belt and Road uh, issue. Uh, you have the complete trampling of human rights, right? They have the death penalty if you violate the uh, stay in place uh, thing in a significant way, right? And, and WHO is on board, and WHO has, uh, you can go read their comments, right? They're just shocking. 
uh, they say, well, there's nothing China's doing that uh, not everybody else is doing. And uh, that's absolutely false. Uh, China delivered the news late in the game after they completed the trade agreement with the United States and, at, and right in the middle of the Davos meetings. They were very deliberate on what they wanted to make their announcement. In that period of time, up to the, the trade meetings and the Davos meetings, uh, between January and February, 400,000 Chinese flew uh, to the United States. The Chinese delegation was in the White House shaking hands while they knew they had a pandemic. The WHO knew all of these facts, would not declare a pandemic, and deny that there was person-to-person -person spread until Taiwan forced the issue by, by letting it be known that they gave information to the United States. Then the WHO changed their, uh, their talking points. Up till then, they were following Chinese talking points. Xi Jinping installed the head of uh, who, their, their director, over U.S. objections. We wanted a U.K. physician. They put in this, this, uh, this person who does China's bidding. And so uh, he's going to be out. Hopefully Ben Carson or someone like that takes that spot. And uh, the U.S. ought to just be horrified. And uh, all, all the data points I just gave shows this was not an accident. Right. So I don't think it's a bio uh, bio uh, weapon. Uh, it wasn't intended from the onset. But after they saw what happened, they went on a worldwide spending spree and brought, brought all the PPE, right, all the health garments in Brazil, Australia, Europe, the U.S. Uh, they bought it all out knowing full well that they had a global camp pandemic on their hands. And they bought them all up and now are selling them back to us at a higher price trying to look like saints. So this was premeditated. They withheld information. They won't let you know who patient one is. Today, there's breaking news coming out of Forbes, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, the AP has a very good piece out today uh, showing the origins out of the lab uh, and the Chinese cover-up of the lab, uh, bleaching out the fish market, et cetera, that shows they knew the danger. They knew it was a global pandemic. They would not share information. They wouldn't share scientific information. They still will not let us in there. Uh, to identify the initial strands of the uh, of the biological evidence, and uh, it's premeditated. It's a wish we didn't have to say that, but it, the data is all right there, and there's no other conclusion. And uh, after the fact, there will be a trial uh, for global global human rights abuses of it of an enormous magnitude, perhaps like we've never seen. Dr. Dave Brad, we really appreciate you being on America's Roundtable, and we know that a great many of our listeners are seeking the light at the end of the tunnel. They remain optimistic, yeah. and uh, that this difficult pe you know, season will pass. What hopeful message would you relay to our fellow Americans and our allies abroad? Yeah, I would just tell them uh, God's in charge, and uh, the United States uh, it can turn around and be innovative and entrepreneurial and creative like we've always been. And there is always great hope because the American people are great, but they're gonna have, the American people are gonna have to fight through the establishment, through the elites, through the billionaires that have placed all sorts of bets on China. And so it's gonna be a huge undertaking to turn it around. The American people can handle it. Uh, and if we turn to God, we can handle it with ease. And so with that, I just thank you guys for all you do for, for your leadership across the globe. Thank you so much indeed, Dr. David Brad. Thank you, Dr. Brad. And uh, Congressman David Brad served in the Commonwealth of Virginia's 7th District from 2014 to 2019. He currently serves as the Dean of the Liberty University School of Business in Lynchburg, Virginia. Thank you so much. God bless. Great to hear your voice again. Thanks, Joel and Natasha. God bless. Thank you for joining us on America's Roundtable, a radio program from Washington, D.C., with America's leading voices joined by leaders in business, government, media, and the think tank arena. America's Roundtable is an initiative of the International Leaders Summit. At the America's Roundtable radio program and International Leaders Summit, we thank Lancer Broadcasting and the pledge for their partnership. We encourage you to follow us on Twitter, at I Leaders Summit, as well as at America's RT, on Facebook, International Leaders Summit, and also America's Roundtable. Visit our website at iLeadersSummit.org.